I'm excited to review this trailer. A lot of people have been sending it to me, so you guys ready? Let's get into it. You look troubled. I am. You're losing something. I know what that's like. Okay, my first kind of initial thought is I love the way it looks. I love the aesthetics. It looks like good, high quality content. My second thought, stopping right there, is I love what Jesus said there because he's showing that he related to us, as the scripture said. Now, with that being said, real quick, actually, I should probably say that um, I've only seen the first season. I haven't seen the second season. But at the beginning of the first season, there was a disclaimer that they put before the um, season started where it said that they dramatized the story and that they added some back story and dialogue with the intent to illuminate or support the truth in scripture. So the point in saying that is to know what you're watching here. You're not seeing a word for word scriptural presentation. So as long as you know that, you're not going to be too offended because if you go into here thinking that this is only going to be quoting from scripture, then you're going to be super offended. And I have more thoughts on that, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. What are you losing? Time. Oh, so it looks like this must be getting closer to the end of his life. I didn't know that they were going to get there so quick. Oh, and I thought I got a glimpse of it. Let me double check to make sure. Yeah, if you look, it looks like it's Mary being held back. So this most likely is going to be in that timeline, it appears, right before Jesus is about to be crucified. Interesting. All right, let's keep going. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And by the way, that comes from Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, of course. Someone touched me. Okay, that actually looked really cool. It looks like that was the part in Mark 5 where the woman who's bleeding chronically, she touches the heel of his, or the, what do they say, the heel of his garment, something like that. Anyway, she touches his garment, and then we read that Jesus noticed the power leaving him that healed her. I, I like that. That looked cool. Let's keep going. If you are really the one who is to come, should we look for someone else? Go and tell John what you hear and see. Okay, yeah, of course, that was from, um, I believe, John 11, when uh, John's disciples came to Jesus and they were asking if he was the Messiah because on behalf of John. And so Jesus responds by saying, look at the evidence. And this is where he talks about, um, look at the, um, the blind now have sight, um, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and so on. So he's given some public evidence in order to validate the fact that he is who he claimed that he was. So I love that passage, by the way. Anyways, let's keep going. What is it? Where did we stop? It's him. I'm Judas of Keriot. I have chosen you twelve as my apostles. Don't feel any different? I don't need you to feel anything to do great things. Okay, that... I don't know where that came from. Um, I can't think of a scripture that ties to that. It kind of seems like a... Um, a reflection of postmodern culture, like maybe trying to get people in culture today to understand that you don't have to rely on your feelings. Because I think in culture, a lot of times, a lot of people think that in order for them to know that God wants them to do something is they're waiting for a feeling, which I don't believe we see in scripture. So maybe this is a way of being like, um, it's like love. You don't wait for a feeling of love to act in loving ways. So maybe it's kind of a parallel to that to get people to understand. I don't know, maybe John 6 after they communion. Like, I, 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 I don't know. So if you can think of a scripture that this ties to, let me know down below in the comments. But there's stirring in your hearts in the middle of such division and unrest. Is Father God being revealed to you? Now, I will say real quick, this is a random place to stop, but I will say that I understand what it's like to watch this and be kind of a little annoyed or bothered maybe by the way that Jesus is represented. And when I think about it, I think the reason why is because when I read the scriptures, I picture Jesus to be a certain way, right? And so like, whenever I see a physical representation of Jesus, it always conflicts with the idea of Jesus that I have in my head, you know, so the personality and stuff like that is kind of persona and stuff. So I can see why people would be put off by that when they see Jesus in here. And I could see why they would be upset if they see like Jesus having humor 
or you know maybe looking timid or afraid or something like that because we don't read those emotions too much in the scripture the emotions that jesus had and so we all have this kind of expectation or understanding in our own minds of what jesus would be like and whenever we see something like this it's probably going to conflict with it so just a random thought i had come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest uh, Matthew uh, eleven twenty eight, I believe that passage is. A scourge of false prophecy must. Okay, that right there looks like the Sanhedrin to me. I'm pretty sure that's the Sanhedrin. It could be someone else, but that's what it looks like to me, what's going on right there. Jesus, if you do not renounce your words, we will have no choice but to follow the law of Moses. Okay, that was interesting. It looks like he's upset um, for Jesus on his behalf. So he's like kind of looking out for Jesus, which we never see that like in any of the movies I've seen on Jesus or anything. They're always really kind of angry. Unless this isn't the Sanhedrin. I'm trying to think, um, oh, it could be, it could be actually when Jesus was kicked out of Nazareth. Um, that's in, what, where is that again? Let me see. Yeah, Luke 4, when Jesus was kicked out of Nazareth. So the story is basically Jesus goes to Nazareth, he goes to the synagogue, and then um, he starts reading from the scroll of Isaiah, and then he says that this is him who's being talked about in the scriptures, and they get all upset and kick Jesus out of the synagogue, and then they chase him up the hill to try to knock him off of the hill, but Jesus gets away. Um, so that might be what's going on here, which is why he's looking kind of regretful when he says that um, he'd have no choice but to um, enact the law or follow the law of Moses, that sort of thing. We will have no choice but to follow the law of Moses. I am the law of Moses. Okay. <laughs> My first thought with seeing that is, kind of looks like that clip um, in uh, one of the Avenger movies where Iron Man says, I am Iron Man. <laughs> but outside of that, um, I'm not really sure where that is from either in scripture. I think it's probably a paraphrase or a summary probably of some other passages. But what kind of throws me off is the identity statement there when he says, I am the law of Moses. Because my initial thought was this is going to be from um, the passage, I think it's uh, Matthew 5, 46, I believe, where he talks about how the scriptures testify of him. But when I hear him say that I am the law of Moses, that's an identity statement. So that could be best I can guess maybe is like John 1 maybe where um, the word became flesh, the word was God, the word was with God. And so um, the law is the word. And so therefore he's saying that he is the law, or maybe he's just saying that Jesus is saying that he's the fulfillment of the law, um, something like that. So again, this is one of those places where I'm not exactly sure what scripture is being referred to. And if you know, go ahead and let me know down below. All right. They're here for Jesus of Nazareth valuable than gold, more precious than rubies. Force them out. We are still Rome. Everyone then who hears these words of mine. Okay, right there. That looks like the woman touching um, Jesus' garment, where we talked about there earlier in Matthew, I mean, I'm sorry, in Mark 5. That looks like what's going on in that scene. And if so, that's actually pretty cool. It's cool to kind of see these things that you read about and, and being able to better envision what happened. I think that's pretty cool. Let's go. And does then will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. I'm the one who caused their hunger. I should be the one to feed them. Okay, that's clearly um, Jesus feeding the 5,000. Um, but what doesn't make sense to me Right there, at least, is when he said, I caused them to be hungry. Oh, unless it's referring to the feeding in the next chapter, the feeding of the 4,000. Okay, here's what it probably is. So in verse 32, it says, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for those people. They have already been with me three days and have had nothing to eat. So that's what it's referring to. Okay, now it makes a lot more sense because that one didn't make any sense to me. All right, looks like we're almost done with the clip. So let's go ahead and finish this and then I'll give my thoughts on it overall here at the end. Okay, it looks like it ended with that clip of seeing the four or the 5,000, whichever scene this is. And that looks 
amazing. So when I see that clip, actually, this actually makes me think of Joe Rogan, because if you guys recall, I did a video on Joe Rogan a while back where I played a clip of Joe Rogan talking about how when he thought about the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, he thought that it just sounded so silly and stupid and he just couldn't take the Bible seriously because of it. What did he do with fish? Did he fucking give people fish or some shit? Make some fish? The whole thing's so stupid. But that's where I think something like this is helpful and where I think it can shine. I know in Joe Rogan's podcast, somebody told him about The Chosen and I have no idea if he watched it or not. But if he does watch something like this, I think that it can help him understand from his perspective, this could be something that could have actually happened in real life because now it's actually not just sounding like a story. You can actually have a better idea and you can envision it happening. So when it comes to situations like that, I think that this is actually a really good tool Tool that you can use for evangelism. Now, I say that with the caution of giving this to somebody as if this is a replacement for the Bible. It's not, of course. And I don't think that the creator of The Chosen, Dallas Jenkins and his team, I don't believe that they believe that it was. But I personally have heard testimony from people who have came to Christ because of this and who have started reading their Bibles because of it and it reignited their faith because of it. So I think in this way, what they're doing is good work. So my overall views on this trailer was I liked it. I thought that it looked really good and I'm looking forward to seeing the third season. I got to watch the second one first to keep catch up. But I think that as long as you know what you're watching, you're okay. I think the danger only comes in if you think that this is a replacement of scripture or it's going to quote scripture word for word exactly in all instances. Then I think you got a problem because you have people quoting stuff that they believe is in the Bible, but in reality, it's just from the Chosen series. So that's where it could be a problem. But outside of that, I think that there is a positive that comes from people watching this. And I think that God can use this as a tool to bring people to himself. And that's what I pray happens with this series. No matter what your thoughts are, just be respectful and leave your thoughts down below but i really hope you guys don't mind me asking again but i just have to say one more thing what do you mean